Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Snellus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's resume our microbiology and infectious diseases playlist. In the previous video, we have talked about Staph aureus characteristics, diseases, diagnosis, and treatment. Today, we will review all of this. This will be a very quick review. Please watch the previous videos first, otherwise there is no hope for you. But first, let's answer the question of the previous video. We have a 26-year-old patient with acute red eye and discharge from the eye. The discharge happens every day, day and night, crusting, especially at the corners of the eye. When you wipe it out, it comes back again. Family members had similar symptoms. What's the diagnosis? And what is the causative agent? And the answer is, this is conjunctivitis, of course. Acute red eye with discharge. Of course, this is conjunctivitis. The question is, is it bacterial or viral? When you see discharge day and night, crusting, especially at the corners of the eye, and when you wipe it out, it reappears, this is bacterial, hands down. The causative agent is Staph aureus because this is an adult, especially with these kinds of symptoms, and family members had similar symptoms too. Other causes of conjunctivitis is the famous trinity, Haemophilus influenza, strep pneumoniae, and Moraxilla catarralis. Let's review. As you know, microbes are bacteria, fungi, viruses, or parasites. That's why the field of microbiology studies bacteriology, fungology, mycology, virology, and parasitology. Kingdom phylum class order family genus species. When I utter Staph aureus, Staph is the genus, aureus is the species. Staph aureus is gram-positive coccus. Staphylococcus aureus are gram-positive cocci that are catalase-positive and coagulase-positive. They are spherical, they lack endospores. Bacteria do have a cell wall and a cell membrane. Humans do not have a cell wall, but we do have cell membranes. Prokaryote versus eukaryote. The structure of gram-positive versus gram-negative. Gram-positive does not have an outer membrane. Gram-negative does. Outer membrane, like any membrane, is lipid, which includes LPS, lipopolysaccharide, which act as an endotoxin. It's an antigen, including polysaccharide O antigen, against which you will respond and secrete antibodies against the antigen. LPS is also pyrogenic, aka causes fever. And since gram-negative has an outer membrane, there is an inner membrane, therefore there is a periplasm or intermembrane space which contains peptidoglycan. Both of them have cell wall. Whether you're gram-positive or negative, cell wall exists, but it is very thick in gram-positive, thinner in gram-negative. The cell wall is made of peptidoglycan, which is peptide side chain and a sugar backbone. Gram-positives have tachoic acid in the cell wall. They have lipotechoic acid in the inner membrane. Gram-negatives do not. Here is a comparison between gram-positive and gram-negative structure. We have talked about this before. Please pause and review. If you have any problems, refer back to video number two. Now we'll talk about the gram-stain technique. The free market is ruled by those who are able to see and plan long range. The better the mind, the longer the range. Similarly, the gram-stain is ruled by those bacteria with a thick peptidoglycan cell wall. The thicker the wall, the purpler the stain. If you're gram positive, you have a thicker wall, you'll appear purple. If you're gram negative, you have a thinner wall and you'll appear pink, i.e. less purple. You do the gram stain by getting the bacteria, adding crystal violet, and then adding ethanol to wash out the crystal violet. You will successfully wash it out away from the gram negative because they have a very thin cell wall, but you will not be able to wipe it off of the thick gram positive. That's why the gram positive will retain the crystal violet and will appear purple, but the gram negative will lose its purple and will acquire the new counter stain and will appear fuchsia, pink. Can you differentiate between staph and strep without a microscope, without stains, without cultures, and by using only one drop of a solution? Yes, this is the story of catalase. If you have hydrogen peroxide, what do you think is gonna happen? Staph is catalase positive, it's gonna give you water and oxygen, giving you bubbles. Strep will give you no bubbles. Catalase helps the bacteria destroy your H2O2, the harmful, and convert it to H2O and oxygen, the harmless. 
the bacteria is protecting herself from your secret weapons. Can gram-negative bacteria make spores? No, they cannot. How about gram-positives? Only some of them can. Staph aureus is not spore-forming. In fact, none of the staph are. In fact, neither the strep are spore-forming. Staphylococcus has coagulase. Streptococcus does not have coagulase. That's why staph gives you what? Folliculitis, abscess, carbuncle, all of them are confined into a certain locale. Why? Because coagulase will clot me in a distinct area. I will not spread as far as compared to streptococci. They go sepsis, cellulitis, necrotizing, fasciitis, erysipelas. These are widespread up and down your skin versus an abscess which is local these are some mechanisms by which the bacteria evade your immune system pause and review in this video we'll talk about the characteristics of staph aureus then we'll talk about the disease then diagnosis and last treatment structure we have a capsule a cell wall a cell membrane virulence factors and don't forget my slimy layer Virulence factors of Staph aureus, structural components, toxins or enzymes, structural components, capsule, slime layer, peptidoglycan, cell wall, tachoic acid, protein A, the toxins, we have cytotoxins, exfoliative toxins, enterotoxins and toxic shock syndrome, toxin 1. Cytotoxins are very toxic to my cells, exfoliative toxins cause skin diseases such as staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome in children. Staph enterotoxins are A and B. A will give me food poisoning. B will give me pseudomembranous colitis. Toxic shock syndrome toxin 1 will give me, guess what? Toxic shock syndrome. Staph enzymes, coagulase, hyaluronidase, fibrolase, lipase, nuclease. The capsule is made of polysaccharides. It inhibits phagocytosis. The P and the P. Please don't ever forget the slime layer. It is relevant in Staph aureus. It is even more relevant in Staph epidermidis, which we will discuss in a future video. The slime layer is made of sugar because sugar makes you sticky, if you know what I'm saying. And you need some protein such as adhesin. And you will adhere to all kinds of prosthesis. Artificial valves, check. Joints, check. Shunts, grafts, catheters, you name it. That's why it's very important that these are kept clean in the hospital. The cell wall is thick in staph aureus. It has peptidoglycan and tachoic acid, peptidoglycan, the P and the N. Pause and review. Next, surface adhesion proteins. Since they are adhesins, they will adhere to the bacterial peptidoglycan cell wall. They also adhere to your own tissue. Examples, staphylococcal protein A, very important, binds to your IgG, especially at the FC portion, prevents antibody-mediated destruction of the staph aureus. It can also trigger an artificial acquired hypocomplementemia not to be confused with congenital hypocomplementemia. We also have fibronectin binding protein, which binds to your fibronectin, and clumping factor protein, aka coagulase, which causes coagulation. That's why Staph aureus causes folliculitis abscess furuncle carbuncle, less likely to cause cellulitis necrotizing fasciitis erysipelas. Deeper to the cell wall, we found the cell membrane, just like your membrane. It has lipid bilayer, some carbs, and something unique to the gram positives, lipotechoic acid function, prevention of osmotic damage. They also act as anchors for enzymes, and this is where penicillin binds. It's not just the slimy layer that helps staph adhere to artificial prosthesis, because the staph also has adhesins. But this is not for the prosthetic artificial devices. This is to adhere to your cells. That's why many of the population has staph aureus living in their nasopharynx as part of the normal flora. Do you remember the story of the chef who caused food poisoning at the restaurant because he was picking his nose with his finger? Yeah, he was getting staph aureus from his nose and onto your plate. Bon appétit. You'll have all kinds of enterotoxin A in your body. But don't worry, it's mostly self-limiting. Coagulase will help the bacteria coagulate. So, we will react with globulin plasma factor, forming staphylothrombin, which is a thrombin-like factor, 
as any thrombin it converts fibrogen to fibrin to help the staph aggregate and localize into a certain area. I can get folliculitis, abscess, blister, bully, furuncle, carbuncle, impetigo, but not sepsis, cellulitis, necrotizing, fasciitis, erysipelas. Less likely. I did not say it cannot happen, it's just less likely. As compared to to streptococcus pyogenase. This lovely coagulase, aka clumping factor protein, can help us identify Staph aureus using lab diagnostics. And here is my mnemonic about coagulase, the vowels mnemonic. Pause and review. Is coagulase the only enzyme that Staph aureus possess? No, we have others. Hyaluronidase, which will hydrolyze hyaluronic acid, that's how you get carbuncle, that's how you get multiple sinus tracts, that's how the carbuncle became bacteremia by invading your deep fascia. And fibrinolysin, which dissolutes fibrin clots, and lipase to break down your lipids, and nuclease to break down your nuclear material. Take a deep breath, because we are done with characteristics of Staph aureus. Now we'll turn our attention to diseases caused by Staph aureus. Some of these diseases are caused by the bacteria itself. Others are caused by the toxins. If the disease is caused by the bacteria, you can give antibiotics. But if it's caused by the toxin, do not give antibiotics. They are called antibiotics. Bio, they are anti-living organisms. They are not antitoxins. If I order some labs, what will I see? Antibodies. Against whom? Against the bacteria. But in cases of toxemia, I can see antibodies against the toxin, not against the bacteria. Big difference. Please understand that once the bacteria has formed a toxin, even after you kill the bacteria, the toxin can persist. And this is the idea behind many types of food poisoning in microbiology. Here are some examples of diseases caused by the Staph aureus bacteria itself. Here are some examples of disease caused by Staph aureus toxins. SSSS is caused by exfoliative toxin. Toxic shock syndrome is caused by toxic shock syndrome toxin 1. Food poisoning is caused by Staph enterotoxin A. Pause and review. Repetition is the mother of pedagogy. That's not my word, I stole it. Staph skin infections. I can get folliculites. What's that? Infection of a hair follicle. Let's extend it. It becomes furuncle or boil. Let's coalesce multiple furuncles together. Congratulations, you have a carbuncle. It's deeper than furuncle, especially on the back and on the back of your neck with multiple sinus tracts. Oops, go deeper bacteremia, septic embolus in the blood, pyemia, and then we can go places to the heart, acute bacterial infective endocarditis, to the lungs, lung abscess and empyema, to the brain, bacterial, cerebral abscess, bacterial, encephalitis, bacterial, meningitis, etc. Staph aureus skin infections, pause and review. Can Staph aureus cause acute bacterial endocarditis? Yes even on an intact heart valve, because this is a high virulence bacteria. If I am an IV drug user, believe it or not, my acute staph endocarditis is going to be less severe than a person who got it by a complicated infection. You know why? Because I inject the drug intravenously, it goes to the right side of my heart, which is way less severe than infecting the left side of the heart. So hey, medicosis, are you suggesting that I use drugs? Shut up. Next, staph osteomyelitis. Staph can go to your bone, especially the metaphysis, for reasons that we discussed before. And then before you know it, you raise the periosteum, you cause a subperiosteal abscess, a sequestrum surrounded by an involucrum. You can even open a sinus tract in the middle. Since the bone is near the joint, I can develop septic arthritis before you know it. If you aspire this joint, you will find what? Purulent picture. More than 75,000 or even more than 100,000 white blood cells per microliter. And you can culture it, you'll find staph, predominantly neutrophilic because this is a bacteria, of course. This could be a septic knee, septic hip, etc. Staph scalded skin syndrome is caused by exfoliative toxin. We have two types of this, exfoliative toxin A and exfoliative toxin B. Peeling and desquamation, everything here is two. SS multiplied by two. Exfoliative toxin A and B, skin peeling and disquamation, bully and blisters, no inflammation, no cytolysis, no bacteria, no leukocytosis, 
It's too benign in children, but too dangerous in adults. Too benign in children because it heals on its own in 7 to 10 days, leaving no scarring, no fibrosis. By the way, all of this started from perioral erythema that spreads. When it spreads, I can get the positive Nikolsky sign. This is a systemic disease. The localized version of this disease is called bullus impetigo. Next, staph aureus gastroenteritis and enterocolitis. Gastroenteritis happens by enterotoxin A. When we talk about pseudomembranous colitis caused by staph, it's the enterotoxin B. Remember the staph food poisoning, please? It's a watery diarrhea after you ate contaminated potato salad ham, salted pork, and all kinds of dessert. This is a disease caused by the toxin, not by the bacteria. It is self-limiting. It's going to resolve within 24 hours. Next is the story of my hero, the tampon-wearing female neurosurgeon who works for 12 hours straight in just one surgery. She did not have time to change the tampon or the pad, and then she developed what? Toxic shock syndrome. Hypotension, fever, diffuse, generalized, macular erythematous rash, including the palms of the hand and the soles of the feet. It can get worse, multi-organ failure. It can get worse, purpura fulminans with DIC. These are the diseases that have fever and rash involving the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Toxic shock syndrome is here. Here is a quick review on Staph aureus. Please pause and review. We will review the characteristics of Staph aureus from Picmonic. Let's go Staph aureus. Here is a Staph. Here is Oreo. Gram positive. Here is Gram cracker positive. Angel cocci spherical eyes. Catalase positive. Positive cat. Coagulase positive. Positive clogs. We have protein A, which is a virulence factor. It inhibits phagocytosis. It inhibits your macrophages. MRSA is a resistant Staph aureus because it altered her penicillin binding proteins. Next, we shall talk about the diseases caused by Staph aureus, also from Picmonic. By the way, Picmonic website has more 1,400 Picmonics like these. They are animated and you can watch this in a video format and you can quiz yourself afterwards. You can create your own playlist. There are playlists that are already created for you. It's a great website. I've been using it for 10 plus years. Diseases caused by staph. Let's go. Let's start by the diseases caused by the bacteria itself. And then we'll talk about the toxins. All right. Disease caused the bacteria itself. Skin diseases, abscesses, impetigo, osteomyelitis, and septic arthritis, pneumonia, and endocarditis. Let's talk about the toxin ones. I get food poisoning by the enterotoxins. I can get staph scalded skin syndrome by the exfoliative toxin. And I get toxic shock syndrome by TSST1. After we finish talking about staph, in the next videos, we'll talk about streptococci. Just remember, staphylococcus has staphylokinase. Conversely, streptococci have streptokinase. Both are called fibrolysin. Staph has staphylothrombin, which is the coagulase. Strep does not. By the same token, streptococci have streptolysin, which is hemolysin, such as ASO. Do you remember this? Yeah. But staph does not. Staph has nuclease. Strep has an equivalent DNA. Diagnosis of staph aureus was discussed in video number six in this playlist. Let's review quickly. Microscopy, culture, nucleic acid amplification test, identification, these are biochemical tests, and antibody detection. Microscopy is use gram stain, you will see them clustering and purple in color, of course, because they are gram positive. Culture, staph can grow on a medium that's selective or non-selective. Non-selective like what? Like this basic thing right here. Selective like what? Mannitol salt agar. Why? Because staph can ferment mannitol. How do I kill other co-cross contaminants by adding sodium chloride solution it's gonna kill the other bacteria leaving staph alone for you to recognize and diagnose staph can grow aerobically or anaerobically usually rapidly and will give you yellow colonies yellow golden colonies that's why we called it aureus which means golden and we called it staph because they cluster together. Identification is important, especially for coagulase. This is the cheap tube coagulase test. You add the plasma, 
you add the bacteria, boom, the blood is gonna clot because this is coagulation, which caused coagulation. You can detect my own antibodies against the cell wall of the Staph aureus, particularly the tachoic acid. Treatment, some of them are self-limiting, just supportive care. Bullus impetigo is treated by systemic antibiotics. Non-bullus impetigo is usually mild, can be treated topically, but if it's severe, you go systemic. Abscesses are treated, well, it depends on the clinical scenario, but the basic idea is incision and drainage and antibiotics. What antibiotics work against staph? Ox, clox, dicloxin, clox, and naph. For staph, oxacillin, cloxacillin, dicloxacillin, nafacillin. These are known as anti-staph penicillins. How about MRSA? Don't forget vancomycin. How about Versa? Give linezolid. Quiz time. Can you mention three diseases that will give me a positive Nikolsky sign? Let me know the answer in the comments. You'll find the correct answer in the next video. Some clinical pearls. Normally, the function of your spleen is that it contains splenic macrophages, which remove organisms from the body, especially encapsulated organisms. And that's why, if I remove your spleen, or if you have disease that destroys your spleen, you'll end up with increased risk of infection. With whom? Encapsulated organisms, such as what? The famous shin and staph, because staph has a beautiful polysaccharide capsule. Clinical pearl number two, antibiotic review. There is something called aptomycin and polymyxin. These are not cell wall synthesis inhibitors. They are cell membrane disruptors. Whose membrane? the bacteria's membrane, okay? Polymyxin, for example, polymyxin, it pokes pores and holes into the cell membrane of the bacteria. Oh, remember what was the function of the cell membrane? To protect the bacteria against osmotic damage. What if I puncture that membrane and pierce it with holes and pores? Well, the bacteria will die by osmosis. The good news is, daptomycin will kill bacteria. The bad news is, it can perforate your own cell membrane because as a human, you do have cell membrane. You do not have a cell wall, but you do have a membrane. It can be neurotoxic or nephrotoxic. That's why we stopped using polymyxin systemically. It's only available today, topically. Staph aureus in a nutshell. Please pause and review. That wonderful pearl about polymyxin was taken directly from my antibiotics course, which is available on my website, medicosisperfectsnetics.com. This doozy comes with 40 downloadable videos to teach you about antibacterials, antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasitic medications. I also have a kidney physiology course, cardiac pharmacology course, and a toxicology course. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Snellus, where medicine makes perfect sense.